school because I uh, interviewed the Power Rangers. Do you know them? The, the, of blessed memory or no? They're still alive. <laughs> What's going on with them? <laughs> I'm not following. But uh, I didn't go to school many times because that, that became the main thing, the main thing I'm doing. Now, these days, approximately then, I also, I, I don't come from a religious uh, family, not at all, <laughs> secular family in Israel. And I will tell you a very strange sentence now, which may sound really, really weird, okay? Until the age of 15, I never met a religious Jew in Israel. Not in, I don't know, uh, Kathmandu, in Israel. It's possible, it's possible to live in Israel without knowing anyone who's like religious, from Orthodox, Dati, Sioni Dati, Sishim, Bishchasidish, Litvak, and all kinds of uh, Jews that are like, uh, keep the Torah. And at the age of 15, I met a few teenagers, and they did a very simple thing. They invited me to come for Shabbos, that's all. And another magic happened, just like I met our uh, language at the age of six, I met our heritage at the age of 15. And again, my life was changed, I was changed, I uh, started being Shomer Shabbos. At first, that was the only thing I did, Shabbat, that was the only thing I did. And many, like Balei Tshuva, have these fascinating stories. How did you change your life? You, you know these stories, right? Adventures, and they met a famous Arab, and they did something extreme, and they were very, very famous, and then they discovered the truth. Now, my, my story, I can promise you, it is the most boring stories you have ever heard about how someone became Orthodox. But, but what can I do? That's my story. I came, I was invited for Shabbos in the city of Be'er Sheva, the same city you've already mentioned. It's a big city in the north, in the south. And these days it was very, very quiet because Israel was still ruling Gaza Strip then. The IEF was there before we gave it to the Palestinians. So I was there again and again for Shabbos in, Be in Be'er Sheva. I was invited there. And for the first time in my life I discovered something that for you it's very natural, it's very obvious. Uh, Kiddush and Shalom Aleichem and the Chala to say a Motzi and to bless and to sing a Shazchai. All these things for me were new. And it was something to discover it at the age of 16, wow. But when I came back home, my personal Shabbos remained as usual. It never changed. I mean, when I came to Belsheba, Shabbos was something special. But when I came back home to Erzeliya, where I lived, I did what I usually did on Shabbos, interviewing people, calling them, writing, typing, working, going out with friends. So what made me change my Shabbos? Okay, what changed my Shabbos in my personal life, in my home? What happened, again, it's, it may sound weird, but what happened is, one Shabbos, Shabbos meal, it was morning, after they came back from school, we sat uh, in one of these uh, Shabbos families, and we're singing and talking, you know, Shabbos. And then, my friend was like 15, 16, like me, she invited me. But her little sister came running from the door, the entrance door. She was running and saying, I think I did a fadicha. Now let's check your Hebrew. What is a fadicha? What is a fadicha? No. Like a joke, yeah? A little bit more accurate. It's not really a joke. It's, more, it's good because a joke is a bidicha. It shows you, you know the good, but a fadicha, it's, it's a special it's a kind of a joke, yeah? What? Like a prank, yeah, yeah. It's like doing something very um, embarrassing. Uh, embarrassing. Thank Move you, Eliana. Embarrassing. <laughs> embarrassing. You help them, then it will not be a fadicha here. But they don't know what is a fadicha. A fadicha is something embarrassing you did, like a mistake. It's not a tragedy. It's okay, but it's something you, uh, you didn't have to do it. So this little sister is come. She's running, and everybody are like eating and talking, and she's saying, "I need a fadicha." Now what is the fadicha? And she's saying the neighbor knocked on the door, she's not religious at all, very secular neighbor, a new immigrant from Russia, knocked on the door, and she asked me now for a glass of sugar. And I gave her a glass of sugar. Is it okay? Was it a fadicha? Is it allowed? What do you think, by the way? What is she doing with this glass of sugar now? 
Shabbos morning. Baking, exactly. She's baking a cake now. You gave her, and the discussion started. They all started discussing this event. Should she give her the sugar? And one brother said, what did you do? No, she's baking in her oven. In her oven, she's baking a cake because of you. It's an Avera. It's not good. And the other uh, uncle, I think, said, no, it's good. Because maybe she is making tea for the family. It's possible. And she really likes to drink sweet, sweet tea. So she needs a lot of teaspoons with sugar. So you get it's good, it's good. And another guy said, wait a minute. What would happen if you didn't give her the sugar? So what can she do? What can she do if she really needs sugar? Exactly, drive and park and buy and pay and take it back and drive and park again. And wow, so it's good to give her the sugar, right? And of course, and the discussion went on and on and on. And I was sitting there with all kinds of um, creative explanations <laughs> where uh, I've heard all kinds of things there. Someone said maybe it's because nefesh, maybe it's like diabetes, okay, so you need sugar, I don't know. And I was sitting there like this, like this. Uh, these people are crazy. No, they're really crazy, completely crazy. It, it, it's, it's, so, it's not rational. How can they really sit here and discuss the, what? Why does it matter if you give it the sugar on Monday? Is it okay? So on Saturday it's not okay. What? It's ridiculous. It's cute. they're crazy. I knew they're crazy. I want to go home. No, I want to go home. <laughs> Enough with these religious peculiar people. But then on Monday Shabbos I took the bus from Beersheba to Herzliya, and I had a lot of time to think on my way back home. And when I walked. You know, on the bus, when I started uh, uh, my way, I was at Shomer Shabbos. But when I came back home to Ratzelia, I decided I want to be Shomer Shabbos. I want to be a part of this thing. What happened? I seriously thought about this event. And I started thinking, what happened here? I see these people, I know them, they're normal, they're nice people. But they treat it very seriously. There is a very serious, there's a very serious thing going on here. This discussion represents something very serious. If you have a big, like, uh, meeting with a businessman, you discuss every small detail. If you sign a contract, you discuss every small thing. That's not ridiculous. True, Shabbos, Shabbos is more serious than a business contract. And you treat it very, very seriously. It's not funny to ask small, boring questions about Chavez. I think the whole atmosphere I've experienced when I came with their uh, uh, like Chavez meals and their Sheva, the whole atmosphere is based on these roots, on these serious roots. Thousands of questions, thousands of answers and questions for thousands of years. These are the roots and Chavez is built on these roots. And I remember I was thinking to myself on my way back home, I want to be more committed because I see it's not only the singing and the customs, you know, the minhagim and the, all the, the kind of nice things you do on Shabbos. Of course it's nice, but it's serious. I want to be committed to this mission. So I told you, it's a, it's a boring story. It's not a fascinating extreme story. But so I had to tell my bosses, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, Israeli's media works 24-7, unfortunately, not 24-6. I had to tell them I will start working 24-6. And it's not because I'm lazy, like some of them said, it's because I think the six other days will be blessed if I will rest for one day. And okay, I convinced them, I explained I'm not willing to work on Shabbos anymore, although they were prime time shows on Shabbos. But then I had to tell my friends in the personal, you know, uh, circle around me, I'm not going out with them on Shabbos anymore. And that was more complicated. But I saw there was like a sign that's the right way. At the age of 18 or 19, a friend of mine, his name was Yoni, arranged a birthday party, uh, his own birthday party to himself, and he invited me, and it was on Friday night. And I had to explain, I cannot come. I can't drive. And he said, okay, so I'll send you a cab. I'll send you a taxi. I'll send you a non-Jewish 
taxi driver, an Arab driver, no, I'm sorry, uh, ride the bicycle, no, I'm sorry, I'll send you, uh, what, what, what would be a haftar and a hatamocha? Uh, he started arguing with me, and I had to say, no, I'm sorry, I cannot come on Shabbos. And Yoni was very, very frustrated. He said, I thought you're normal, what's going on here? And then he called me again, uh, and he said, listen, I discovered I have another primitive friend. He's not willing to come on Shabbos. Another annoying guy, so really ridiculous, he cannot drive, and he says, I can send him a cab. And I, don't, I don't know, I'm afraid I will find out I have more weird friends like you, so I'm postponing the event, and it's going to happen once a Shabbat, Saturday night. Okay, great, so I can come. And then uh, I came, Yoni was standing at the entrance accepting all the guests, and I was one of them, and I came and Yoni said, oh, welcome, here's the primitive new friend I have, yeah, I show my Shabbos, welcome, Sivan. I want you to meet the other guy, because of you two, I had to change everything. I want you, want you to meet the other guy. Now, if you can all look here, that's the other guy. That's my husband, Yeah. <laughs> <Yad. laughs> this is the other guy that was also not willing to drive anymore. <laughs> so I saw Shabbos brings a lot of bracha, a lot of blessings into my life. I just became Shomer Shabbos and I met my husband because of Shabbos is the matchmaker, you know. So maybe Yoni is the matchmaker, I don't know, maybe we should pay him. Do you pay matchmakers here or no? Yeah, your parents have to pay here for the school, they don't have money to pay for anything else. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> anyway, and now after introducing myself for like half an hour, the uh, journalist, you know, they love to speak about themselves. Now I want us to discuss the concept of Gevura together. And this year, this year, I had, again, the privilege of interviewing this person. Do you read? No, well, well no, no quizzes anymore. I will tell you who is. Exactly, yeah. That's Natan Sharansky. And I had uh, the privilege of interviewing him this year. Now, I want to tell you something. You already know what is a fadiha, right? You study the new Hebrew, one Hebrew word with me today, and it's that. It's not a serious word. Don't write it in Hebrew test exams you have. But a fadiha, as we said, it's something embarrassing. Now, at the end of the year, the Hebrew year, now, at the month of Elul, I was asked, what is your professional fadiha this year? You know, they tried to, like, it was a survey, they asked many journalists, what is the fadiha you did this year? As a journalist, not a personal one, I had many personal fadiha, but what is the a professional mistake, the professional embarrassing thing, of the year, you know, like, uh, uh, like to conclude the year. And I said this interview, and I want to explain, and maybe I want to try together to fix a mistake I did, to correct something uh, embarrassing that I did, and maybe you can help me with that. So I had, again, the privilege of interviewing Natan Sharansky with his wife, Avital. You all know, uh, Israel celebrated its 70th uh, uh, Independence Day, 70 years since the establishment, uh, 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 since Israel was established. 70 years, and it was a very a special Independence Day. And every year on Yomatzmaut, there's a prize called Pras Israel. Have you heard of it? Pras Israel, Israel's prize. Special people get Israel prize from all different fields. They're like elected. And uh, Sharansky was one of the winners. And for me, it was a chance to interview him and his wife. Now, he can, gives a lot of interviews, but she never spoke for 30 years. Now, she was the leader of the movement for Soviet Jewry 30 years ago, and she never spoke since Sharansky was released from jail. For me, it was a special opportunity. I called them and I told them, listen, I think that the right timing with the Independence Day and with the uh, Israel's Prize, I want to sit and hear for the first time your personal heroic story. And they agreed. For me, wow. <laughs> I was there the next day, that's me. I have a cameraman here. I have soundman standing here, okay? It's, uh, we're working uh, and we're, we're three people uh, working together. And we came, that's their house, and we came 
to listen for the first time to this couple telling again the, one of the most fascinating chapters in our history. Now, he thought uh, the word Jew, it's like a curse, it's like a bad word you're not supposed to say. He never knew as a teenager what does it mean when you say Jewish. He thought there are many curses like a stupid, ugly, okay? Jewish, it's like a, when you curse someone, okay? So he said Jewish, that's what he thought. He never understood there's another meaning in the word Jew. At the age of 20, he, uh, at Moscow, communist Moscow, he saw a book about Jewish history. It was illegal to hold that book. Of course, it was illegal to read it, but he read it. And he said, when I started reading this book, I was 20, but when I finished reading this book, I understood I'm 3,000 years old. That's a real age, because I'm a part of something bigger and longer, with a lot of meaningful things I never knew. And he became very active in the underground movement to release the Jews from Russia. Now, Vital also, at the age of 15, heard the word Jewish for the first time in her life. Her older brother, Michael, went to get his ID card at the, like at the age of 18. And then they wrote, the Russians wrote, nationality, Jewish. And he went back home asking his parents, what is it? What is this word? And they tried to explain, and Avital felt a spark. And she also joined the underground movement. That's where they met, okay? That was uh, their matchmaker, the underground activity for Jews in communist uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, at the first dates were there. But uh, when, when they decided to get married, it was the first Jewish wedding they ever saw. Okay, they never saw a Jewish wedding. They went to an old Jew and they told him, we want to get married. So he arranged the wedding, but they didn't know what they're doing while they were getting married. Now, one day after the wedding, Abitan is going to Israel. She gets a permission and she goes to Israel. And Nathan is saying, wait a few days and I will join you in Israel. It will take me three, four days to come, to, to get a certificate and come to Israel. So she thought, okay, I will wait for a few days. But eventually, she waited for 12 years. 12 years. He was in jail for 12 years, and she was out there fighting for him. 12 years later, they met, and they were sitting with me, telling me this fascinating story. So what is the Fadiha? What I describe now is very special. The Fadiha is, and this is my message to you, before if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. But the Fadiha is, at the end of the interview, I asked Sharansky, why are you giving this exclusive interview? Why, after all these years, you're sitting with me and telling again the story? And he gave a beautiful answer, but, and this is my fault, this answer wasn't a part of the clip of the video I edited. I had to edit it out because it was too long. So the last question is not there. It wasn't published, it, it wasn't screened. Nobody heard it except from you, because I came here and tried to fix it, and tried to correct it. I asked him, what is, why are you giving this interview? And he said, I'm giving this interview because I want every young Jew that is watching me to know that he is braver than me. How can you be braver than a man that sat for 12 years in Russian jail? Were you ever investigated by KGB people? Did you ever had, uh, have to think, wow, it's Shabbos today, so I will not work hard in jail? Did you have, a, have like a strike, like a hunger strike, because they took your tefillin, and you want, to, you want your tefillin back? But nobody, nobody here in this room did any of these heroic things, okay? We live in a democratic, free world. And Sharansky said, today, for teenagers today, to keep, to be a part of the Jewish nation, it's even harder. Because when I was in jail, everything was clear. Bad and good. I was completely good, they were completely bad. Everything was clear, it was hard physically. But mentally, it was very easy to see right from wrong. The minute I walked out from jail, he's saying, I got confused. The world out there is tempting. Is Everything is available, everything is accessible. You can do everything. 
Okay, everything is open, everything is free. And today, to be a Jew today, nowadays, in this generation, this is the first time nobody is chasing us. Think of it. When you, you study history, there was always some mean guy chasing us. From Paro to Hitler to Stalin to Lenin, there's always someone there chasing us. Your great grandparents were all chasing. Now what? Nobody's chasing you. So Sharansky is telling you, and he's a real hero, that you are greater than him. That your Gevura is bigger because if today in an open world you choose to do one mitzvah and one chesed, as I see character counts here, right? I understand you, and you work on your midot to vote, and you bless, and you bench, and you are a part of the Nakiva activities, and you do good things with your Jewish identity, it means you're braver because you can choose to do anything. Nobody's forcing you to do, any, to do anything. And if you're choosing it, then you are maybe the bravest generation we ever had. So that's the message. Unfortunately, it was out of my clip, out of the video I showed on Israel TV. But I, I'm, I'm thinking about it since I did this interview, and I think that was the most meaningful message I've ever heard. So I want to share it with you, and I want to uh, bless us all to be brave, to be real, real Giborim, in an open world, in a liberal world, in a democratic world, to choose to have devotion, to have love, love toward our identity, and to develop it. Nobody's chasing us, but we will chase, we will want to do good things of Torah and Mitzvah. Thank you very, very much, all of you. Thank you. There's so many layers of inspiration actually there. And I'm not hoping that we have some students in here who are really thinking and have some questions or comments to make based on something you heard, whether it be in terms of Johnny's career or in regards to Shabbat, Judaism, heroism, interviewing others, journalism, so on and so forth. So if you have a question, raise your hand. And I, I'm not sure if this mic is going to reach everybody in all the rows, so I'm going to ask you to stand up and say your question really loudly, and I'll repeat it if needed. Isaac, your hand was up earlier. Go ahead. Um, speak loudly, don't stand up. Oh, my dad, I think, in the 80s, and uh, my dad in the 80s actually went into Russia and uh, um, like delivered supplies to Sharansky. Wow. And then he got beat up by the KGB like 50 times. Wow. <laughs> wow, so he's a hero. Okay. And Isaac like, would go home to share the story with him because it'll add a layer of inspiration to his experience. Wonderful. Does anybody on the side of the room have a question or a comment? Something to say? Something to share? Okay. Go ahead, Benji. Say that. Do I ever feel my job is dangerous to, to go out and do things like as a religious woman or, or because of the Palestinians or because of the reality shows? What do you mean dangerous? <laughs> when it comes to terror or when it comes like, to spiritual things? Or both? <laughs> okay, both. So first of all, yeah, I had to cover many times, unfortunately, I had to cover terror events and a prote protective edge uh, operation. We took Eitan three, four years ago in Gaza. And of course, the Second Lebanon War, yeah, I had to cover uh, also the military fields sometimes. It's not the main issue, but it's part of, of uh, the fact that you live uh, in Israel. But Baruch Hashem, in recent years, less, less terror attacks. And uh, um, it, it's considered the last uh, like 10 years I've considered very safe and quiet in Israel. Uh, so um, basically, no, I, I don't go into, you know, battlefields, no. And no responsible journalist is doing it. But sometimes, because I cover, like, I interview terror victims, I, I have the privilege of bringing meaningful messages because they are very special people and they have, like, usually you speak about uh, Sarah Netanyahu and, uh, you know, all the politics and economic things, and suddenly when you're interviewing, like, uh, the family of terror victims, it's like touching destiny. They have more meaning, meaningful things to say about life, about Zionism. Israel, so sometimes it's uh, it's not so bad to, to listen to them. 
Now, spiritually, of course, I have problems, but I want to tell you, you also have problems. It's not a personal problem of mine. We're all like, uh, we're all like uh, doomed or maybe like, uh, it's part of our destiny to be part of it. I want you to help me because there's one sentence in Hebrew you all know by heart, okay? And I'll show you, I'll prove you that we all share the same conflict, okay? Hamalacha goer, you know to say it in Hebrew, right? Hamalacha goer oti, Nikol ra, right? Yevarech et, adarim, mikarev ahem, shemim b'shem avotai Abraham v'Yitzchak, v'yitru l'arov, masof, b'kerev, ha'aretz, exactly, ha'aretz. The girls know it all by heart, I don't know what's going on here, but... So, v'yitru l'arov, b'kerev, ha'aretz. What does it mean? I want them to multiply abundantly, may the angel who redeemed me from all harm, bless the youth, and may they be called by my name, in the name of my father, the Rav Yitzchak, and may they multiply abundantly like fish in the midst of the land, okay? Haaretz. Now, fish belong to the sea. I don't know what's going on here in the lake, but fish, fish go, fish live, they need water. They dry out when they're on the land. So why does Yaakov Avinu blesses us all? That's the blessing Yaakov gave to his sons, Ephraim and Menashe, but it's us. Uh, bless every time your parents bless you with this uh, sentence and you say it when you pray. So why is he telling us to be like fish in the midst of the land? Why? Why, why is he saying be like fish in, inside your, the water, the ocean? The, and many commentators are explaining that we're all, this is the conflict you're asking about. We all have to be sometimes like fish in the midst of the land. We belong to the sea. The sea is like the Torah. The sea is like our wisdom. But we all work in a different world. And we meet different people with different values. And we all have to remember that we're fish in the midst of the land. And Yaakov is blessing us that we will remember. We will not feel so good in the other kinds of cultures. Okay? In exile. Everywhere we go. Okay? And we will know that the right place for us is is in the sea, and we will be connected to our nature, natural values. But again, so every time I go to work, I, I, I live this conflict, but it's not my conflict, it's uh, our mutual conflict. And uh, of course, yeah, you have to remember it. I don't want to feel at home. I say it all the time, I work there, I, there are some people that are my friends, but I don't, I don't feel there like I'm at home. No, I feel at home in my home. But um, as long as we remember there is a conflict, there is a paradox here, it will help us remember our uh, heritage and our values. Okay, last question maybe or?